Hello and welcome to the April IASB Update podcast. My name is Claire Short and I am part of the communications team at the IFRS Foundation. Today I'm joined by Hans Hulvorst and Sue Lloyd, Chair and Vice Chair of the IASB respectively. And we'll be talking about topics covered at the board meeting held on the 27th and 28th of April 2021. Let's dive right in. Uh, one of the key projects discussed was goodwill and impairment and staff this month continued their update from last month on the feedback received during the 2020 consultation on this topic. Hans, can you fill us in on what you heard? This month we continued to hear a presentation about the feedback that we received on our proposals in the discussion paper on goodwill and impairment. And we particularly discussed our proposals to improve disclosure about the subsequent performance of business combinations, which is very important for investors to see whether a, uh, a business combination has been successful or not. And while there was the, the users support this uh, very much, but among preparers, there are a lot of concerns about both the costs of such disclosures, but especially the commercial sensitivity of such the, the disclosures. So that is something that we will certainly have to discuss uh, further. And then there was also, we discussed the feedback on a proposal that I personally uh, favored a lot, which was a presentation of equity, excluding goodwill on the, the statement of financial position so that the investor can see, very clearly can see to what extent Goodwill contributes to uh, equity, but that proposal almost found no support. People said, well, listen, investors can do that very easily by themselves. Uh, they don't need that. So this goes to show that the influence of the chairman of the ISB only goes so far. I think it's fair to say that we didn't hear a lot of new evidence or conceptual arguments for or against retaining the impairment only uh, model or reintroducing the amortization of goodwill. But at the same time, I think there are a lot of people who have said, well, perhaps no new arguments, but in the last decade, it has become clear that the impairment only approach doesn't work very well, that it tends to lead to too little too late. So that is something that we will discuss as well. After I've left, we will have a joint meeting with the FESB who are looking at the same questions to discuss this, this matter further. Thank you, Hans. Staff are still going to complete their presentation of feedback on the Goodwill and Impairment Project next month. And then this will be followed by a discussion of the board's preliminary views, which is currently planned for the June meeting, but this could change. The board also heard an update on feedback received on the Dynamic Risk Management Project. It's been a while since this project has been on the agenda. Sue, could you give us a brief overview and also a, a sort of a summary of what the board heard? Sure. So this project's um, mainly focused on getting better transparency in the financial statements about how banks carry out their interest rate risk management strategies on a dynamic basis. And we've been trying to develop a core model to help investors understand those risk management strategies and how well companies execute those strategies. So we last discussed this project in October last year, and this month uh, the staff gave us with an update on some outreach that they've been doing uh, with banks to understand their risk management strategies and to get some reactions to this core model idea that we're working on. And so they've been out doing detailed outreach with uh, 28 banks from around the world. Now, overall, I think while there were some aspects of the model that people thought were, were helpful, a number of concerns were raised, including some concerns about the extent to which the ideas really aligned with risk management practices. One common example that people raised was that the model is built on the idea of asking banks to compare the risk management strategy with a single target strategy. And the banks said, actually, they don't have a single strategy. They set ranges and, and that would need to be accommodated. And I think more generally, there were some concerns that while we'd focused on sort of transparency and understanding of risk management, the banks really felt that the focus should be on resolving accounting mismatches between assets and liabilities measured at amortized cost and the derivatives being used for risk management being measured at fair value. So really we went through a discussion to identify areas that we think we need to look at again, such as how we could take into account this range approach that the banks have. 
and also to see whether there's some other concerns such as the mismatches and concerns about the interaction with regulatory capital regimes that we should um, reconsider. So we're going to keep working through the, these issues and work out you know, how we go forward with next steps in the next few months. Thanks, Sue. Staying with you, can you share with us what the board heard in relation to the FICE, Financial Instruments with Characteristics of Equity project, please? Sure, and in case people need a quick refresher, our FICE project is looking at a couple of things. Firstly, trying to improve the articulation of some of the requirements in IES 32. So, for example, to see if we can provide some more clarity on how you assess the classification of derivatives on a company's own equity. But we're also looking at improving the disclosures around financial instruments that a company's issued, particularly when they're more complex financial instruments that have both got debt-like features and equity-like features. And this month we were looking at disclosures and we looked at a few different things. The board agreed with the staff's recommendations about requiring companies to, to disclose more information about key terms and conditions for compound financial instruments and also financial instruments that have both debt and equity features. So, for example, to require terms and conditions to be provided to highlight in the case of a financial instrument that's classified as debt, um, whether it's got some terms and conditions that are more equity-like. So, for example, if I've got something that's debt classified, but the interest might not be paid in some circumstances because of capital requirements, for example, highlighting those sorts of unusual features. We also talked about potential dilution. The board decided that companies should be required to provide disclosures about the maximum potential dilution that could arise because of financial instruments that they've got outstanding and also to provide information to help investors understand the, the likelihood of that dilution occurring. So, for example, if there are conditions that need to be met before shares would be issued, what are those conditions? Or what's the strike price? To try and help investors understand, you know, which dilution they should be more focused on than others. We also had a good discussion about some potential new disclosures to help investors understand what would happen in a liquidation scenario in terms of the priority of various financial instruments that a company's got on issue. And we talked about whether information should be provided by companies to give an overview of priority, where they'd set out their capital structure broken down into different categories of financial instruments. Um, and we had a good discussion on this, and there was a lot of agreement on the general approach that the staff was recommending, but there was also some suggestions and for clarifications around scope and some other things. So the board's going to take away the input we gave them, work a bit further on it and bring it back for us to discuss again in some more detail at a future meeting. Hans, let's mm -hmm. come to you. The primary financial statements project was back on the agenda this month. Can you summarise the decisions that were made by the board this month? Sure. Well, first of all, just as a reminder, last month we decided to go ahead with three of our proposals namely the requirement for companies to present an operating profit subtotal in the statement of profit on and loss, widely supported. Then the requirement for companies to include information about the management performance measures in the financial statements in the notes. That was also widely supported and we're going to look if we can extend the scope of non-GAAP measures to be included in the notes since a lot of people were interested in that as well. And we also decided to proceed with eliminating some presentation options in the statement of cash flow. This month, we discussed some of the remaining proposals that were set out in our 2019 consultation. First of all, we addressed matters concerning disaggregation and decided to state the purpose of disaggregation more clearly, emphasizing that disaggregation should be based on an assessment of materiality. And we will emphasize that information should be disaggregated based on a single dissimilar characteristic, if material. And we will also develop some guidance on how to aggregate and disaggregate items. It's a complicated thing to do, uh, so people will need a bit more detailed guidance. Our discussions on this uh, project will continue in, uh, in the following months. Thank you, Hans. Finally, the board received an update from the Interpretations Committee. Sue, can you give us a summary of that, please? 
Okay, sure. So we received an update about the Interpretations Committee, I think, rather than from it, but um, about the March meeting. And at that meeting, the committee importantly supported the finalisation of an agenda decision concerning customising or configuring costs in a cloud computing arrangement. So consistent with the new due process, the board didn't object to the finalisation of that agenda decision, so that will now be published as a final agenda decision. And the board was also updated on some tentative agenda decisions that are out for comment, just to flag what they are in case people want to take a look at them. One's about the treatment of non-refundable value-added tax on lease payments, and the other is on accounting for warrants that are initially classified as financial liabilities, but where the terms and conditions in those instruments sort of are changing over the life of the instrument and what the classification effects are. So those tentative agenda decisions are currently open for comment. And if you do want to comment on those, you can send us a comment letter by the 24th of May. Thanks, Dee. And that wraps up our discussion from the April board meeting. There are a couple of other developments from the past months that we'd like to bring to your attention. First, a date for you to diarise. The annual IFRS conference will be held virtually on the 3rd and 4th of June. And more information on this can be found on our website where you can also register to attend this conference. Speaking of our website, you may have noticed that we did a broad update earlier this month. And this update includes a new IFRS standard navigator that aims to make it easier for you to access exactly the information you want. If you visit our news section online, you can find a video introduction to the new navigator, as well as a couple of simple how-to guides. Earlier this month, we also published an exposure draft on the lack of exchangeability project. So that is out for consultation at the moment. And we also announced the appointment of Bertrand Perrin to the board effective this July. He brings with him a wealth of preparer expertise and we are excited to have him on board. And that brings us to the end of another episode of the IASB Update podcast. Thank you to Hans and Sue for joining me, and thank you to our listeners for tuning in. You can find all past episodes of this and our other podcasts on our website, on YouTube, at Spotify, or on your podcast player. If you have any comments or suggestions for the podcast itself, please email me on communications at ifrs.org. Until next time, keep well.